You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. NFT. How could three letters bring so much buzz? Well, if you're in retail, you know we all love a good acronym. But that's not what it's about here. NFTs, or non-fungible tokens, are presenting new opportunities for brands to drive engagement and product interaction in the digital metaverse. If you're anything like me, though, you may feel overwhelmed by the evolving and increasingly hyped digital currency space. For me, it sometimes feels complex and fluid, and because the market is constantly evolving and influenced by so many factors, its future feels impossible to fully pin down. Now for some, that's what makes NFTs and cryptocurrencies so exciting. And in retail specifically, the use cases and in turn, the opportunities are expanding. In fact, CB Insights noted that NFTs can support everything from authenticating tangible goods to reducing e-commerce friction, and even in some cases, generating new revenue opportunities. And with some new success stories emerging, such as Elf Cosmetics launching a crypto cosmetics line, it seems like there are new ways for retailers and brands to carve out their own unique space in this category and truly innovate. But like with any new trend, we need to understand the technical, strategic, and tactical implications. Not just how it works, but who needs to manage it, who drives the plans forward, how to measure it, and most of all, what the keys are to doing it right. That's why I wanted to sit down with two experts who understand both sides of the NFT coin. First, let's get into the brass tacks of NFT technology. Justin Bannon, co-founder of Boson Protocol, shared the nitty-gritty details of NFTs with me, how they work, how they're created and shared. We even got into some of the environmental implications of creating and disseminating NFTs and how they're helping shape the future of digital commerce and digital experience. NFT stands for non-fungible token. So, I mean, let's clarify what fungible means. So a fungible item is one that is essentially identical to another. So, for example, a $10 bill, if you had a $10 bill, I had one, and we swapped them, essentially, we, we're in it's the same, right? So they're fungible, they're swappable. However, you know, in the real world, most items are non-fungible. If I said, oh, can I have your shoe, and I swap my shoe, then it's not fungible, right? So, uh, and that's the same with cars, you know, a house, a jacket, most things are non-fungible. So NFTs, or non-fungible tokens, are these sort of unique digital assets. So unlike one Bitcoin and another, if we swap that, it's pretty fungible, right? Uh, Non-fungible tokens, each one is unique and different. And they've also got some other properties, but some of the important ones is that they can't just be arbitrarily copied. So unlike a digital music file, you can't just kind of have it cloned. And also they can't be deleted without the owner's permission. So if you buy a skin or an item on sort of a, a normal game, the, the owners of the game, the creators of the game could arbitrarily delete it. But with an NFT, if you own it, no one can take that away. So those are some pretty important properties and kind of the sort of properties that you might get from a physical item that until now you haven't got from a digital item. And so these properties, like the you know, the first use cases, very obvious use cases for these are things like digital fashion or art, right? So you can have a unique handbag like you know it's very famous like gucci bag now which incidentally wasn't an nft so you can have a you can have a digital fashion item that's a, an nft or or indeed art however these are like typically static items right and so that's your kind of primary first use case of nfts but nfts are actually far more powerful than that so another property of nfts is they can be programmed so, you know, Boson Protocol uses this property to create what we call NFT vouchers. So these vouchers kind of lock up funds from buyers and sellers, like payments, amounts and deposits. And then they release the funds if the buyer and seller go through with the transaction according to agreed upon rules. So it's like the rules that you might have if you were transacting on a platform like Amazon. But instead of needing a platform, they're encoded within this NFT voucher. 
And so what you have is that the actual NFT automates commerce without the need for a platform or an intermediary. So this is why we call what we do a decentralized autonomous commerce. Oh, that's very interesting because I know just based on the use cases that we've been seeing, like you said, you brought up the Gucci bag. I think Gucci did like a pair of NFT shoes and that was kind of a big unveiling brands like Charmin. They did like NFT toilet paper art. Um, it, it seemed like a lot of these use cases were in either product oriented type activations or art specific, like you noted, or creator driven, right? Like through collaborations. But you're bringing up the commerce angle. So do you kind of see the product slash art use cases almost as like an entry point that could lead to opportunity for commerce? Or do you kind of see these as two very distinct use cases that like a retailer needs to make that decision of like what direction they want to go in? I think these are just different categories of items which until now have had different form factors to represent them or to buy them or to exchange them. Therefore, they've been kind of separate. But Boson Protocol initially is enabling the exchange of sort of physical items using NFTs. But we're expanding also to enabling on-chain items and also digital items. So enabling the exchange of other NFTs and also the exchange of like digital files, like movie downloads, etc. So when you have a common format for representing all of these things, I think the distinctions just become less relevant. And so, you know, you could see, you could create an experience or a, a bundle where you could go and visit a baseball game. So you get the ticket via a, a sort of a, an NFT, you could get collect some food or a meal during halftime, again, redeeming via a Boson NFT, some merchandise from the, you pick up from the store, again, via a sort of Boson NFT, and then even be able to, to download afterwards the digital content from the game, again, via an NFT. So NFTs can really be used to unlock and control access to any physical, digital or on-chain item. It's really fascinating. And, and I'd love for you to kind of clarify something for me around like how the market is looking at NFTs in comparison or in relation to cryptocurrency. Because I know what, one of the things that's been coming up a lot around crypto is the sustainability implications. Are there similar conversations that are happening in NFT world because energy is required to create them? I mean, how does that kind of work? I mean, are these two concepts related? Again, apologies if this seems kind of a foundational. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around all of this. But how are these two concepts or, or areas related? And are there any sustainability factors that are worth noting here? Yeah, I mean, look, there are sustainability factors. But the blockchain that most NFTs are created on, Ethereum, will be moving from proof of work to proof of stake, which is going to dramatically alleviate that concern. So, you know, I think it's less of a of a long term concern for NFTs, probably, you know, more so a things such as costs and the performance of blockchains. But this is nascent technology. It's not yet optimized for efficiency or effectiveness. We're pretty early on in its development. And so we can look forward to improvements in all those dimensions. Got it. Definitely appreciate that. So let's get into that because it is such an early stage technology. Let's dig into some of the opportunities that you're tracking or, of course, that, that you're guiding at Boson Protocol. I mean, fascinating stuff. I mean, can we kind of break down any other opportunities that exist currently or in the long term for retailers specifically, again, kind of knowing that the use cases like Gucci, Charmin, even like Taco Bell, like those exist already. So, I mean, where is the market going there? Sure. So our long term vision is to create like almost like this TCP IP of commerce where all forms of commerce can flow in a tokenized format over Boson Protocol. But we are starting with what we call metaverse commerce. So Many of this sort of younger generation increasingly inhabit online worlds and games. I mean, that's where they play, where they socialize. And um, this is increasingly so due to COVID. You know, my nephews and nieces, they will play games, PlayStation, go online, and they're, they're socializing with their friends, you know, particularly during lock-in, etc. 
So this is where the younger generation is inhabiting and um, and brands are really keen to engage with them in those worlds and those spaces and, and create experiences. So Boson Protocol has just purchased a significant piece of real estate in what's called the metaverse um, within one of these virtual worlds, which is a blockchain virtual world called Decentraland. It's actually, I think, you know, the most expensive real estate purchase today in the metaverse. And we're building this sort of incredible virtual mall experience. So this virtual mall will enable brands to develop a digital in-world branded experience where consumers can sort of like perform gamified branded quests. So, you know, you can kind of go on an Easter egg hunt or assemble something, which then gives you the ability to buy digital items. So, you know, like these digital wearables that we've mentioned, but also with physical twins, which are redeemable in store. So really kind of building on this kind of digital to physical theme of digital to physical quests and experiences, digital to physical redemptions, like buying stuff in these immersive worlds, buying boson NFT vouchers that can be redeemed in store. And so, you know, we're working with some incredible digital designers, um, mainstream designers, game designers and and metaverse architects to create some of these really incredible experiences that mix digital and physical and really has this sort of potential to breathe new life into retail. Justin, you are blowing my mind right now. (laughs) This is amazing. (laughs) So you're essentially creating this, this universe where brands and retailers can acquire digital real estate to sell these digital items or physical twins or digital twins, essentially. So this is amazing. So so imagine imagine you get a handbag that you can wear or some shades that you can wear in world and in game and they've got a physical twin. Right. And, and then you can go to the physical store and get it. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. And then in the store, you've got like in, you know, we're going to have some crazy stuff like I'm probably giving all of our marketing will kill me for giving all <laughs> away, but, um, So we've got this kind of concept of portals, right? So there'll be portals in this virtual mall and then you'll have a portal in like some major high street in a shop window and you'll be able to look into the portal and see into Decentraland and there'll be an invitation, you know, scan a QR code and it will it will give you like a treasure map where you go into the world and you, you have to kind of do some tasks to get. The only way you can buy this kind of rare physical item is by going through some sort of quest. Wow, that's amazing. I, honestly, I didn't even think through the possible correlation or integration into gaming. And I mean, and it makes total sense. So you're envisioning the NFT market largely being influenced or guided by these highly immersed consumers that are in the gaming world, probably largely younger consumers. Is that fair to assume? Largely, yeah. Yeah. And where everything is kind of gamified, experiential, and the boundaries between digital and physical are becoming kind of just completely blurred and almost kind of old fashioned, right? Got it. Yeah. So this helps paint, I think, a more detailed picture for the brand executives, the retail executives now that are listening to this probably and are seeing NFTs everywhere. Like, what is this even? Like, does this make sense for our business? Because it's hard to separate the the buzzy tech, the things that are getting all the headlines and everyone's talking about versus what is scalable and sustainable for my business. What makes sense from a strategic standpoint? So I think the picture that you're painting here helps make that a bit more clear. I mean, are there any other factors, you know, forces creating kind of confusion in the marketplace, do you think? Because I feel like with any tech trend, there's kind of like that, what's a myth, what's a misconception and what's actually real and tangible? Well, I mean, when we're speaking to brands, there's a really strong desire. They see the zeitgeist, they know it's cool. And they've probably got this on their objective. But it's hard, right? The technology is very new and amassing 3D designers and real estate knowing which space. You know, we, our aim is Boson will be for these virtual malls will be <clears throat> putting a virtual mall in every world and every game, right? So we will be syndicating retail exposure to in, in world so that brands can come to us and we can kind of give like this kind of white glove treatment where we can introduce them to digital designers 3D designers, we can give them space in our malls, we can connect them with the technology, and really kind of it's a starter pack. 
and and of course you know our our aim is for, to have those on you know this incredible technology that we've developed used and there's no better way to do that than creating really cool really amazing product so you know what we're doing is is just providing all of that support and then brands are injecting making it really easy for them to kind of to do these experiences and then brands own creative teams are just coming up with some amazing ideas so and for me the, the really interesting thing is that cross fertilization where you know we've got these kind of capabilities and, and and some ideas but then creative teams from brands are like okay how about we do this with this store and we can have this sort of game and this theme and the synergies are, are incredible I want to ask you, you know, for the folks listening that are super excited about this concept, I think there's so much potential, but maybe there are members of their leadership team or the decision making team that they're going to have to convince about this, right? I mean, I'm sure this is something that a lot of executives deal with. I mean, how would you recommend they position NFTs as an opportunity, as a viable investment to kind of combat the, oh, this is just hype, like, let's not even touch this right now sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, well, look, there are two arguments, right? One is my firmly held belief is that NFTs are to things, right, to things and items, what cryptocurrency is to money. So if you believe that cryptocurrency, its programmability, its, you know, kind of peer-to-peer nature and all the amazing things you can do with cryptocurrencies. If you believe cryptocurrencies are going to become a thing and going to disrupt money, then it's natural that you would believe that their non-fungible equivalents, NFTs, that represent things instead of money, will become this kind of dominant form factor for, you know, kind of exchanging items, right? That's a long-term and somewhat philosophical argument. You know, the short-term tactical argument is this caught the imagination of the public, of brands, there is a huge amount of exposure and zeitgeist around this. And so for a for a campaign, this is an incredibly kind of exciting thing to do to kind of energize your brand and, and reach new audiences and engage existing ones. So yeah, I mean, I have a deep philosophical attachment to NFTs, but right. <laughs> it, it, it's a pretty simple argument for doing something in this space right now. I love that. So I love your breakdown of how it can help unlock that creativity, right? Like unravel what's really possible in the realm of customer experience, because we've seen so much change over the past year. So like, what's stopping us from thinking a little bit bigger and and a little bit differently? So I mean, where do you think this space is going over the next year? What are you thinking about? What's exciting you because you're so immersed in this incredibly fascinating world? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're just seeing mainstream adoption. And the other trend that we're seeing is that coming out of lockdown, lockdown is in force. They say we've kind of moved moved into digital five to 10 years in just over a year due to kind of lockdown, right? But there's also the other one is what happens when we come out of lockdown. So this whole, what we're finding is this digital to physical theme just really resonates with the fact that we've been forced into digital and remote and now we're coming out of it and we, we're going to go back in store and, and, and there's lots of brands that um, want to re-energize the in-store experience and there's no better bridge from lockdown to you know back in store than doing digital to physical with this whole NFT and, and metaverse site guys. Forced into digital and remote and now we're coming out of it and we, we're going to go back in store. And, and, and there's lots of brands that um, want to re-energize the in-store experience. And there's no better bridge from lockdown to you know back in store than doing digital to physical with this whole NFT and, and metaverse site, guys. If you don't think your business is quite ready for digital twins in the metaverse, don't fret. There are clearly other ways you can join the NFT movement. In fact, more brands and retailers are using NFTs to create unique art and even products that fans can own. You can create a custom line like Elf Cosmetics and Gucci have done, or you can create some custom art with creators and influencers like Charmin did. Regardless of your approach, you have to make sure it ladders up to a broader brand strategy. 
Deb Gabor, founder and CEO of Soul Marketing, broke down the brand opportunities that come with NFTs and what teams need to do to truly make the tech valuable for generating brand awareness, engagement, and even loyalty. So I can really go through the idea of how NFTs help brands grow their footprint beyond the immediate products and services that they sell. I think that NFTs provide this really interesting opportunity for brands to create a unique branded experience that transcends what they're actually exchanging for consumers' money. And when you think about NFTs as being kind of a one of a kind, 100% owned by you digital thing, there are people out there who are actually collecting these things. And, And when you take something that has immeasurable value to one person, it's worth whatever they're willing to pay for it. And so that's kind of the idea behind NFTs. But in general, what NFTs can do for brands are number one, create this unique brand experience. This is a way to own a piece of a brand or own own something that demonstrates to you and to other people, your fandom of a particular brand. NFTs encourage interaction. The opportunity to promote an NFT out on the internet and have people be interested in that and want to exchange their hard-earned money for that and increase those things in value and then get bragging rights from owning them is a way to interact with the brand that isn't actually having you interact directly with products and services. I always talk about this concept of irrational loyalty, which is when people are so indelibly bonded to a brand that they'd feel like they were cheating on it if they were to choose something else. And when people are irrationally loyal to brands, they buy things that have those brand names on them. And I think about great brands like Coca-Cola, for instance, which Coca-Cola is a soft drink company. Actually, now for all intents and purposes, they're a water company. But there are people all over the world who are wearing Coca-Cola t-shirts and Coca-Cola socks and wearing Coca-Cola hats. Well, the same is true of NFTs, where people demonstrate their irrational loyalty. There's nothing more irrational than buying something that isn't the product that the brand sells and demonstrating to the rest of the world that you are a fan of that brand. So that's a lot of the ways that NFTs can be used in augmenting a brand's presence in the world and and sending a message to the world about a consumer's use of that brand. Once you break it down like that, I totally understand why people are so excited about NFTs right now because a lot of the engagement that's happening now between consumers and brands is happening online. And sometimes that feels intangible, right? Like it feels like, okay, like this is just kind of floating around the world. It's floating out (laughs) in the cloud or wherever it is. So like, and it is, it truly is. And that's what's so wacky about it. And that the fact I think where people are scratching their heads is like trying to understand why are people willing to throw down in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars or even millions of dollars to get their hands on some kind of a digital deliverable, right? It I mean, it does. When I first heard of this, I'm like, that's absolutely nuts. But then <laughs> if you really take a step back, it's kind of like one of the great brands that I think about that's right here in Austin, Texas is Yeti. They started out by producing these incredible coolers that actually worked really, really well that people were paying upwards of $300, $500, $600 for. Well, there are people running around with Yeti hats and Yeti shirts and Yeti cups and, and all of these things. Like they've created a lifestyle brand. NFTs are a way for brands that weren't previously a lifestyle brand. Take Pringles, for example, or Taco Bell. And both are brands that have have effectively used NFTs. And basically, they're using this digital thing, this digital token, if you will, to almost create a lifestyle brand out of it. It seems wackadoodle to me, but, but it's going on out there because NFTs create scarcity in a realm where there's often infinite supply on the internet. Right. And I think the angle that that's very interesting for me is this notion of using NFTs as a way to partner with creators and artists. Like I know, I think it was Charmin is doing these NFTs, but it's tied to one of a kind artistic work. And you shared some other examples of brands releasing NFTs now, Reebok, Gucci, Taco Bell, like I said, Charmin, very broad spectrum of different examples. So are there any that kind of rise to the top for you that you think are like, like wow, that that is really cool. And it really helps you kind of realize the potential there? 
Yeah. One of the more down to earth examples that I think about, and we both mentioned them a minute ago, is Taco Bell. So Taco Bell did a series of NFTs that were associated with their Live Moss Scholarship Fund. And this was a really cool thing where they created these digital one-of-a-kind things and had them for sale. And they partnered with a cause, right? This is an opportunity for a brand to create some great brand association and also give people who are fans of the brand and also fans of a cause that's aligned with the brand an opportunity to show their support for the brand and then up-level both brands, being the cause, the scholarship fund or a nonprofit or something like that and the brand itself. And I think that that's a really good sort of down to earth example. Some of the other like really, really wacky examples out there are I saw coming out of Asia, a line of only digital sneakers. Sneakers are, they've become collectibles and they're very, very popular. And, and lots of designers are, are taking on this sort of limited edition designer sneakers that are being done in conjunction with different artists and things like that. I, I've seen NFTs that were only digital likenesses of sneakers. They weren't even, you're not even able to buy them anywhere. They don't exist in the in real life realm. It's an interesting phenomenon. And I kind of thought that eventually that this was going to happen. I don't know if you've ever played that game Crypto Kitties. Have you ever seen that? Tell me more. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Well, Crypto crypto Kitties, it's something that's really cute. There's millions of users all over the world that are playing Crypto Kitties. But Crypto Kitties is a digital game where you can buy and create these unique digital cats. Each one of them is completely unique in how it looks and how it behaves, kind of like your own pet. Well, this has taken off like crazy. And so it's sort of like the online version of a Tamagotchi, if you remember Tamagotchis. Okay. Now you're speaking my language. (laughs) All right, great. You're a child of the 90s, right? So you probably, Mm -hmm. yeah, you probably know what Tamagotchi is. So so it's kind of like an online, an online version of a Tamagotchi or something like that. And it's a way for people to kind of put their unique thumbprint on something digitally, because you're creating this unique thing that cannot be duplicated in any realm. We can do that in real life with handmade items and one of a kind things and limited edition things, it was just a matter of time before that was going to hit the internet and we were doing that with digital content. So first edition songs, for instance, I know Kings of Leon launched an entire album through NFTs. Individual pieces of art. I have some one-of-a-kind art pieces that I bought in galleries and at art shows and frankly on the street in a lot of places that I've traveled all over the world. NFTs are like the online version of those things. They create great connections to a place or to an experience, or in the case of brands, to a brand. And those experiences last well beyond the process of just purchasing them. And I think I think that's what all of these brands are looking for, is to create a deeper emotional connection with buyers through NFTs. Interesting. So as we're talking about the different use cases, the different approaches, I mean, I can't help but wonder who even owns this? Like, is this a marketing thing? Is this a brand thing? Is it too early to tell? Like, I'm just trying to imagine like creatives sitting around a table and saying like, let's do an NFT. Like, how does that even work? And please tell me if you don't have an answer or any idea and it's still very much up in the air. But I mean, there are so many different ways to approach this, I feel like. There are a lot of different ways to approach this. I can come at this really just from the experience of I own a brand strategy and marketing firm. And one of the things that happens is when we're working with a client and we're trying to identify what are the goals here? What is the brand that we're looking to create? How do we want to connect with this brand's best customers, the ones that are most highly predictive of their success? What are their values and beliefs? What do they like? How do they want to bond with the brand? And what are ways to get their attention? You know, we sit around a table these days, it's on Zoom, it's the virtual table, but I am bringing people back to the office very soon so we can get that creative combustion. But when we're together, we're thinking up all kinds of ideas. Things like, what if we created a world where people existed in a digital realm only, where they could actually simulate their use of the brand? That might be a place where NFTs could come from, like the blending of virtual reality or augmented reality, and then having buyable and tradable tokens as part of that. That might be a place. So I have a feeling that there are a lot of really smart, creative people sitting around in advertising and branding and digital marketing agencies thinking these things up. 
I also think a lot of this really came from the creators themselves, that creators were looking for opportunities to give their art whatever that artwork might be, whether it's visual art or it's musical or it's some form of multimedia, giving that more life and gaining a bigger audience. So I've seen a lot of that being originated from creators themselves. And in some cases, I'm imagining, I haven't experienced this yet, but I'm hoping sometime soon a really cool creator is going to approach me and say, hey, I've got this great thing. You have this client. Let's work together and do a collaboration. So I think that this is something it's kind of coming from both sides. It comes from the brands and the people who support those brands. But I also think that it's coming from creators. Going back to the Crypto Kitties example, these are individual consumers on the internet who are playing this game where they're making these unique one-of-a-kind digital cats and they're buying and selling them and trading them and sharing them with other people and, and using that as this outward embodiment of the person that they are, if you will. It can eventually become like sort of a grassroots thing where people are creating digital fan art for their favorite brands as well. So I think it's, you know, the ecosystem for this seems endless. Initially, where I see it coming from, just in summary, is the brands themselves and from creators. But I do think that if this is something that really takes off and has staying power, that we're going to see new people, new creators emerging from the world of just general human beings like you and me, who will be showing their love for for brands through the creation of NFTs. Yeah. So as we kind of do dig into these different applications or origins, I guess you could say, of of NFTs and how the ideas can start and, and come to life, it leads to some follow-up questions around like the strategy. And, and forgive me, you know, I'm a, I'm a content strategist, so I'm like, what's the strategy behind this? So, I mean, how how is this being incorporated or how can it be incorporated into this broader, more holistic strategy? Do you think this is happening now or do you think brands are just trying to kind of latch on to the timeliness and the buzz surrounding NFTs? And what do you think it'll take to get to that strategic level of, okay, let's embed an NFT into our marketing plan? I know it's kind of a loaded question. So I mean, do you think that this is a possibility right now? I think it's a possibility. I would say strategist to strategist, like we've been down this road before. So remember when TikTok emerged as the platform that every brand needed to be on, it sort of started, it was more of a grassroots thing. And it was kids who were posting lip sync and dance videos on TikTok. And then now this is the domain of brands. And if you're not, if you're a consumer brand that speaks to Gen Z and you're not on TikTok, then you're totally missing the boat. And I think as with the adoption of any marketing channel, or marketing tactic or program, I think you have early adopters, people who are willing to try it, people who are willing to risk, brands that are willing to stick their necks out there so that they can give it a whirl. And a lot of those brands that are early to these different platforms, NFTs included, are benefiting not just from the NFT, but also from the the public relations value coming from it, right? So, So that's one thing. There's sort of like this gold rush And I think that financially, this market, we're seeing the effects of this gold rush too, right? And then in order for NFTs to be adopted into, when you're talking about your integrated strategic marketing stack, when you're developing your overarching integrated marketing process, platform, plan, tactics, execution, activation, all of that kind of stuff, It's going to have to become part of the marketing vernacular. I think that as more cutting edge brands go out there and stick out their necks like Pringles, like Taco Bell, like some of these high end luxury brands and start to see some positive impact. I think that the news of that is going to trickle down to people like you and me, where we're going to start to consider it part of the stack. But over the last, I would say, five or six, maybe even 10 years, 10 years ago, when I was thinking about B2B clients that I work with, for instance, we weren't talking about Facebook as part of their strategy. Now, Facebook is like a shopping basket item that you have to do something on Facebook. It's not a cutting edge technique. It's just one of the things that you check the box on, just like email marketing is one of the things you have to check the box on. And then other forms of content syndication and activation out there in the market are check the box items. So I think that the trend 
for marketers being able to consider this as part of the marketing strategy and program is that I think we're going to see sort of this early adoption curve. It's going to gain acceptance. We're going to see some early case studies. Then it's going to be, if it really takes off, I think we'll see it'll be a mad rush. And then it's going to, it goes into a phase of where it just becomes a shopping basket item. But I, we have many analogous case studies for this in looking at the different social platforms over the past several years, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, for a minute we had Vine and Periscope and things like that. And as all these different platforms get eaten up and and things like that, it changes a little bit. But things that were once considered cutting edge then become like, well, everyone's doing it and now it's table stakes. I think the same is going to be true of this category as well. Right. Yeah, that is a great point that I'm, I'm curious to see, I guess, how different players in the tech world will try to place their stake in the NFT world and what that will look like from a services or, or solution standpoint. Like, are we going to see a standardization of like the NFT experience and what that looks like? I'm sure this is quite a bit off, but it, it starts to like, as you start to think about the possibilities, you think about, okay, well, how can this scale and what does the long term look like? So def definitely a lot of potential things to consider there. And, and when I think about strategy, I always think about measurement too. Like, how are we going to be measuring impact and influence? And obviously, there's the financial angle, right? Like the like you are paying for this particular piece of art or this digital item. And you set a value to it and that's the transaction. But I mean, are there other ways to think about value, impact and influence measuring success of, of these NFTs that are being released right now? Yeah, I think that the financial value alone is not a proxy for the brand impact. I mean, it's just the transaction itself. You have like the secondary impact of that, which is brand awareness. And as you and I both know, sometimes it's difficult to measure brand awareness. You have traditional methods of measuring brand awareness, top of mind, unaided awareness, aided awareness. You know, are you moving the needle in that way? But every time I go online and I see a story in my news feed that's talking about this NFT that was sold for some ungodly, ridiculous amount, there's almost really difficult PR measurable value associated in that, which goes towards consideration. I think measurement of all digital activities is what makes digital marketing so great for organizations because you can figure out what's working and you can double down on that and stop doing the stuff that absolutely doesn't work. And I think the ancillary businesses that are going to crop up around this, just like the ancillary businesses that cropped up around social media influencers, all of these different influencer measurements and collaboration platforms and things like that. I think I think that we're going to see that if this really takes off, I think that we'll see those ancillary businesses. I think that this is a great opportunity for people on the B2B side of this. So technology organizations and research organizations, anybody who's really helping marketers understand the actual tangible impact of their marketing activities, they need to be thinking about how do we make the activity and the awareness consideration, image building, interaction, engagement, et cetera, around NFTs above and beyond their direct financial value? How do you make all of those things measurable so that marketers know when they're actually moving the needle? Right. Especially if this is built upon partnerships that, with creators, right? Like you want to be able to gauge. I could imagine this kind of sparking a whole different form of creator network or even an influencer network, right? Like figuring out like who has the capability to develop these NFTs and what does it look like? And it's a whole other realm of partnership and you need measurement to be able to gauge which ones are performing best and what you should really double down on. So a lot that kind of goes into that measurement process for sure. And it reminds me a lot of the, in the real world, like in real life, this reminds me of the luxury art market, which is based on value speculation. And I think right now, because we're so early, the value speculation, when brands are doing these partnerships with creators, they're going to known entities. The brands that are going to win in this space are the ones who do like the luxury art 
speculation experts do, right? When they're like, yeah, this art, this person creating this art is going to be big. And where these NFTs are going to have the most value, not just in their sort of tangible financial value, the price that they're able to engender, but more like the overarching value to the brand, it's going to rely to some extent on people speculating about their future value. And so the analog in real life here really is this category of, of luxury art. There's a whole cottage industry of experts out there who are the ones who are sort of the trendsetters and the pace setters and the and the star makers and things like that. I th- I think that that's going to extend into the digital world as well. Yeah, so many great points, Deb. So we talked about a lot. It's clear that there is a lot of potential for NFTs in the brand and retail world. Thinking B two C specifically, but the one thing that kind of rattles my brain about crypto and NFTs, this whole digital space right now, is that it's so, so up and down, right? There are ebbs and flows, value changes on a dime. You know, it seems very shaky sometimes. And uh, don't get me wrong, I could imagine the value of being first to market or an innovator in this space. But I'm wondering if there is going to reach a point where, you know, brands and retailers are going to be taking a step back saying like, oh, like, do we want to invest the time in this. So I want to ask you, just because you've become, you know, an expert of sorts on like the intersection (laughs) of brand and NFTs, whether you like it or not, right? If you had like a gut response to whether NFTs are here to stay or simply part of the hype cycle and the social buzz, I mean, would you veer in one way or another right now? Or is the jury still out? Huh, that's a good question. I don't have a crystal ball, but I do have a lot of experience having been doing this work specifically in the technology field for 30 plus years. And I've seen a lot of things kind of come and go. Your question reminds me a little bit of this classic book, Crossing the Chasm, where they talk about the adoption of new technologies specifically, and that that there's this wave, this race of early adopters who are trying to get there first. And they're sort of like blazing the trail and being the people people who are out there at the forefront of the next frontier. And then you get more and more widespread adoption. And then there's this, I think it's called the trough of disillusionment that happens, <laughs> where I think what you're talking about with regard to the hype cycle is a little bit like what Jeffrey Moore talks about with crossing the chasm, but the hype cycle happens like the beginning to end of the hype cycle is like almost instantaneous. I think about people who were running around, who were running around a couple summers ago playing Pokemon Go. And if you had asked me then if that was something that had staying power, I probably would have said, probably not. This is just a flash in the pan. Consumers get really bored. And until the next really interesting thing comes along that attracts their attention, you have their attention for a short period of time. So to the extent that NFTs can demonstrate some kind of value above and beyond like their trading value, I think it's still too early stage to know. Now, we have some indications, at least financially, when you look at the size of the NFT trading market, we have some indication that people might be becoming quite disillusioned with it. And that is that at the beginning of May, the NFT trading market was estimated for one day on May the 3rd, over $100 million worth of NFT transactions took place. Then fast forward to the end of the month and over the course of the last week of the month, only $19.4 million worth of NFTs were traded. Wallets the number of wallets that were involved in the exchange of NFTs decreased from $12,000 at its, I'm sorry, 12,000 wallets at its high to 3,900 wallets. And so I think we're seeing like a, you know, a micro trough of disillusionment at this time. So I say all of these things, I look into the crystal ball, I think to the extent that we can create value for NFTs that goes above and beyond the direct tangible financial value, the price that's paid for the purchase of one of these things and create some kind of brand value that will define it to some extent. The other thing that I think about with regard to NFTs is that it fulfills a need that was previously unmet 
on the internet, which is being able to address this issue that things are infinitely available on the internet, right? You have a photograph and it's shared on social media and it's liked by several million people and then it's shared by 400,000 people and whatever. It kind of reduces the tangible value of that digital asset. Now, if I, let's say for instance, I, I produce a print that I paint and I draw, and I only produce 30 of those. And because it's so scarce, it increases in value. Let's assume it's really good. And I'm, I'm a terrific artist and I'm not, but if I were, <laughs> people are willing to pay whatever it takes to get their hands on it, like a Picasso line drawing or something like that. That's why things become precious. I think that the internet has been moving in this realm to be able to associate some kind of financial value for something that you can't hold in your hands. And I think that NFTs to some extent answer that. So people are using using NFTs, for instance, to, to lock down a digital image and make it so that it's the only one, so that they own the copyright to it. They own that actual digital thing and they can prevent it from being shared with so many people and therefore devaluing whatever that thing is. So trend-wise, this may not be the final answer to that problem of digital rights and digital rights management and being able to monetize content on the internet. But I think from a trend perspective, this starts to answer that question. It's just been really interesting to see who's adopting it and why and how, and that will drive what this eventually becomes. I learned so much from Justin and Deb in our conversations. It was really helpful that they were able to distill the must-know information and provide some guiding principles to look at NFTs in a more practical and actionable way. I hope, if anything, today's episode provides some clarity for you and even inspires you to expand your creative boundaries and consider the possible role of NFTs in your business strategy. Like with all other emerging trends out there, I know we at Retail Touchpoints will be tracking NFTs closely, so stay tuned for some more insights and even success stories in the future. But for now, thanks for joining us, and if you like what you heard, share your feedback on today's episode across social media or through your preferred podcast player. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, shameless plug here, if you haven't subscribed yet, we encourage you to do so because you will get first dibs on new episodes when they're dropped every Monday. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up. <laughs>